On the 8th of September, the 1st Cavalry Division led the way into Tokyo. Japanese General Gen Sugiyama had skillfully withdrawn all Japanese troops north of the capital in compliance with Eichelberger's orders. Now MacArthur was on his way to the American embassy to raise the flag over the heart of the Japanese Empire. Admiral Bull Halsey was with him. He was not riding the Emperor's white horse as he had threatened to do, but he was present in the procession, beside the Supreme Commander. General William Chase rode at the head of his division, which had fought the Japanese for three years through jungles into the scorched and broken city of Manila. At the sign marking the city limits of Tokyo, Chase ordered his car stopped. He stepped down, walked across the line into the capital, then returned to his jeep for the uneventful trip to the ceremony at the embassy. His men were impeccably clad, their boots shining, their helmets gleaming. Mile after mile of trucks, guns and men moved into the centre of Tokyo, into the last bastion of the land of the rising sun. The emperor's own palace was virtually surrounded by legions of a foreign power. In the grass courtyard of the white-walled embassy, MacArthur enjoyed another dramatic moment in his illustrious career. Standing with Eichelberger and Halsey in front of a drained lily pond, he listened as the star-spangled banner resounded off the walls of the compound. Fully conscious of the importance and irony of the moment, MacArthur turned to Eichelberger and said firmly, Let our country's flag be unfurled, and in Tokyo's sun let it wave in its full glory as a symbol of hope for the oppressed and as a harbinger of victory for the right. Old glory rose above the rubble of Tokyo. Tokyo was occupied. Only thirty days after the bomb fell on Nagasaki, troopers of the 1st Cavalry Division patrolled the streets of the capital. The folly begun in Manchuria and compounded at Pearl Harbor had come to its inevitable end. For the Japanese survivors, the situation was desperate. Soldiers of the Imperial Army had no jobs and faced a purge by the occupation authorities. Sailors had no navy and little hope. The thoughts in many minds centered around the possibility of suicide. Already, General Anami had offered his life to atone for the crimes perpetrated by the military. Admiral Onishi had died in expiation for defeat. Tanaka had done the same. In the suburb of Setagaya, the most famous general of all pondered a difficult choice. Hideki Tojo, the architect of the Pacific War, had lived in relative seclusion for over a year. Deposed in July of 1944, he had retired to an unfamiliar role as advisor to the throne. Younger men acceded to his authority while he watched the war go even more badly for his nation. When the surrender came, the 63-year-old former premier felt that he would be held responsible for the war and made his plans accordingly. It was expected by every Japanese that he would kill himself. As a mastermind in the planning for the war, he would to atone for the unfortunate state of affairs at the end of hostilities. As Japan's situation had worsened, so had Tojo's public reputation. Even his family received telephone calls urging that he commit harakiri. Tojo was torn between the traditional way out and another obligation. He wanted to accept full blame for the war and divert any possible onus of responsibility from the Imperial House. If he lived, he could testify to his own role in the planning of strategy. If he died, he would be taking the easiest way out. He compromised. Just before the surrender, he went to his doctor and had him mark on his chest the exact location of his heart in case he decided to shoot himself. As an alternative, he also prepared his kimono and knives for a possible harakiri ceremony. In his study, he arranged these implements and wrote several last statements, one of which absolved the emperor of any guilt for the war. When his wife begged him not to do anything rash, he promised her that he would keep himself ready for testifying to the American authorities. Yet the days went by and no one appeared from MacArthur's headquarters. It was rumoured that the Japanese leaders were being given time to kill themselves and save the Allies the trouble of dealing with them. On September 10, reporters visited the old man in his garden. They sat and talked with him of the war and his plans for the future. At first he was rather curt, but then became quite friendly. After complaining about Allied bombers' damage to his property, specifically his pine trees, he told them that he alone was responsible for the conflict and would accept full blame. He made it clear, however, that he did not think that he was a war criminal, explaining, There is a difference between leading a nation in a war which it believes right and just and being a war criminal.
When the correspondents left, Tojo was in a pleasant mood and examined their jeep with great interest. He had never seen one before. As they drove off, he waved goodbye to them. The next day, Tojo's time ran out. When orders were cut at 8th Army headquarters in Yokohama to pick up men deemed responsible for the war, his name was on the list. A throng of correspondents rushed out to Setagaya to be on hand for his arrest. The first of them arrived at about 1pm Tojo's house was in an expensive neighbourhood. Placed on a grassy slope, it was flanked on one side by open fields used for farming. To the rear, Fujiyama could be seen some 50 miles to the west. Bombing raids had caused some damage to the area, and an outbuilding on the property had gone up in flames months before. Tojo was at home with his wife and a contingent of Kempei Tai policemen who were there to protect him from Japanese attempts on his life. As correspondents swarmed over the grass outside, Tojo remained behind his study window to the left of the front door and ignored them. They were waiting for a counterintelligence corps unit to arrive from Yokohama. As they stood in the hot sun, some of the reporters got thirsty and asked Tojo's servants to find some beer or something stronger to drink. Still, Tojo remained out of sight. Presently, he called for his wife and told her to get away from the house. Despite her apprehensions, Mrs. Tojo respected his wish and left by the back door for a neighbor's property. Tojo locked his study door and continued to wait. At four o'clock, a six-man CIC team led by Major Paul Kraus arrived at the house. Kraus pounded on the locked front door and demanded to see Tojo. A Kempe Thai man inside gave the message to the general, who answered that he would speak only to those in charge. When they were told this, Kraus and his men stood at the front door waiting, undecided as to the next step. Tojo himself took it. He opened the study window, leaned out and said, I am General Tojo. A photographer snapped his picture. The flash infuriated him. Incensed, Tojo slammed the window shut. Kraus swore. Minutes later, Tojo again opened the window. On the lawn, a reporter looked up and said, This is beginning to look like a balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. Tojo asked if Kraus had the authority to arrest him. Kraus told the interpreter to tell Tojo that he was there to take him into Yokohama. That was enough for Tojo, who disappeared from view. He quickly picked up a .32 pistol which his son-in-law, Hidemasa Koga, had used to kill himself on the day the war ended. Tojo knelt in a chair and aimed the gun at the mark on his chest. At 4.17pm, those outside the house were startled by a gunshot. Kraus and his men broke down the front door and then the door to the study. Furniture piled against it was shoved aside as the mob crowded in. Tojo still held the revolver in his right hand. It was pointed at Kraus, who said, Drop it! Tojo then slumped into the chair behind him, and the revolver fell to the floor. His shirt was open, and a gaping wound showed just below the left nipple. His eyes closed, and he began to sweat. At 4.29, still conscious, he asked for water and was given some by an aide. When he wanted more, an American officer refused because of his condition. The bullet had inflicted a sucking wound. As Tojo breathed, air was taken in and discharged through the hole in his chest. While the correspondents shouted and pushed, an enormous gush of blood shot out from the wound and flew across the room. The boisterous journalists, many of whom had landed at beachheads and seen the fury of the Pacific War, showed little sympathy. The reporters vied with each other for stories. It was as though Tojo were already dead. Look at that yellow bastard. He didn't even have the guts to use a knife. Tojo has earned himself a purple heart. Souvenir hunters went right to work. Someone cut a piece out of the general's riding breeches as he lay in them. Others dipped handkerchiefs in the flowing blood to keep as mementos. One reporter took his cigarette case. The cigarettes inside, of Japanese make, bore the brand name Hope. Tojo never moved. He was still conscious, but did not speak. As the bedlam increased, he groaned once or twice, but that was all. His face was turning grey. Across the street, Mrs. Tojo had watched the scene from her neighbour's lawn. Dressed in gardener's clothes and wearing a sun hat, she had been peering through the hedges at the reporters. When the gunshot sounded, she got on her knees and prayed that her husband would not suffer before he died. She cried softly in the grass for over a half hour then went away from the street and from the horror in her own house. At about the same time, 
CIC Major Krauss went out to get an American doctor. While he was gone, a Japanese physician appeared and had the general lifted from the chair to a sofa bed in the same room. He was covered with a homemade patch quilt and examined. At this point, another souvenir was taken. The bullet that had passed through Tojo's body was dug out of the back of the red armchair and went into the pocket of one of the reporters, Harry Brundage. The doctor was immediately convinced that the general was beyond help, and he simply placed two bandages over the wounds, front and back. The CIC agents insisted that he do whatever he could to help the victim. While the physician fought to save Tojo's life, correspondents fought to release the story. There was only one telephone, in a hall in the back of the house. One reporter got it and held it while others fired information at him. Little things were being flashed to the world. A fly trapped in the room was fascinated by Tojo's sweaty, bald head. It settled on his brow and walked up and down, over and back. It stopped to consider the terrain, then marched again through the wrinkles and folds. Everyone in the room was fascinated. Now and then it would take off and circle the room, but inexorably it would glide back onto the shiny pate and walk through the wet surface. The fly achieved instant fame. An enterprising American newsman ran a quarter of a mile down the road to another phone and had reports on Tojo's condition relayed to him by a Japanese messenger. By mistake, he flashed word to the wire service that Tojo was dead. Fortunately, he was able to rescind the story before it was released to the world. Inside the house, one man cared very much for the stricken figure. Tojo's secretary burst through the crowd of men and cradled the general's head in his arms. He moaned softly as he gazed down into the ashen face. The American reporters looked at him curiously but were not moved. The mad scramble continued. At 6.24pm, an American physician attached to the 1st Cavalry Division walked into the bedlam and took charge. Dr. James Johnson consulted briefly with his Japanese counterpart, then went to work. General Tojo spoke to him through the interpreter and asked that he be left alone to die. Johnson refused. As he began administering plasma, Tojo's pulse quickened. Cigarette smoke hung in bluish-grey layers over the head of the wounded man. People watched his chest heaving and falling and made bets on whether he would draw another breath. While the crowd milled and shouted, an enterprising photographer for Yank magazine stood outside the house and looked in through the side window. He furtively reached his right arm into the room and clutched an object from a table. It was a sniney sword, one of Tojo's own. The cameraman stuffed it quickly down the front of his pants and hobbled off toward the road and freedom. A bored CIC man let him get just so far, then ambled over and asked for the souvenir sticking stiffy inside his trousers. The embarrassed thief pulled out the sword and surrendered it. More photographers had arrived, and they created more chaos. Flash bulbs popped, stepladders were brought in to get better shooting angles. Requests were made to shift the body of the victim lying helplessly under the multicoloured quilt. Some asked that Tojo's head be moved for better angle shots. His legs were crossed and recrossed as the insatiable cameras recorded the scene. His body was just a limp doll to position, an object to photograph. Correspondents took turns being photographed, taking Tojo's pulse. The confusion grew. One cameraman, on hearing that the wounded man was Tojo the Archfiend, had to be restrained from punching him. Dr. Johnson laboured on in the eye of this human hurricane. He gave the general morphine, sutured the wound front and back, bandaged him again and let the plasma drain into his arm. Tojo's condition improved noticeably, and Johnson decided to take him to better medical facilities. He ordered him driven to a clearing station for more care. First, he talked for nearly 15 minutes to the newsmen, who wanted to know if the old bastard would make it. Then they rushed out to file the biggest story of the occupation. Tojo left his home for the last time on a stretcher. General Eichelberger, the leader of the Eighth Army, went to observe him later that night. Tojo tried to raise his head, but fell back and whispered, I am dying. I'm sorry to have given you so much trouble. Eichelberger retorted, Do you mean tonight, or for the last few years? Tojo mumbled, Tonight. Then he offered to turn over his sword to Eichelberger. The American general already had it. Eichelberger issued orders for Tojo to receive the best possible treatment. It was his responsibility to keep the Japanese leader alive for whatever trials were being planned for the war criminals.
A call went out for blood type B. Whole blood was needed since Tojo had already lost nearly half his own. A mess sergeant named John Archinal was tapped for transfusion. Archinal was pleased at the chance. I'd like to see him live so he gets his just due when he is tried. It would be too easy for him to come in here and pass out comfortably. Archinal echoed the sentiments of most GIs. In Tokyo that night, while Hideki Tojo lay ashen-faced in a United States Army hospital in Yokohama, his own people mocked him for the bungled suicide. As reports of his recovery were issued, they were greeted by a mixture of shame and derision from his countrymen. While Tojo fought to die and surgeons refused to let him, three people sat down to dinner in another suburb of Tokyo. One was a general, Field Marshal Gen Sugiyama, Army Chief of Staff at the time of Pearl Harbor. Though bald and afflicted with a permanently dropping right eyelid, he was a strikingly impressive figure. His wife of over 30 years sat near him. The other member of the group was Colonel Shinaji Kobayashi, the general's devoted secretary. They conversed animatedly about the events of the last few days. For Sugiyama and his wife, it was a last meal together after a long and mutually enjoyable life. He planned to die the next day by his own hand. She was pleased. Though she loved him deeply, she felt that her husband, a senior member of the Imperial Army, owed it to the nation to atone for the defeat of Japan. She believed there was no other way to prove to the people that Sugiyama, an honourable man, felt sufficient remorse for the tragedy he helped cause. As they sipped sake wine and ate heartily from the table before them, the couple spoke of more pleasant days. Colonel Kobayashi, almost a member of the family, shared their recollections. The colonel was miserable at the thought that his superior would end his life within hours. As a confidant to the general, he knew the mental struggle Sugiyama had gone through in the past weeks. He also knew the tremendous pressures put upon the old man by his wife, who felt so strongly about personal honour. Kobayashi had watched sadly as the devoted couple clashed over the subject of suicide. The contest of minds had started on the day the Emperor broadcast his solemn declaration of surrender. Mrs. Sugiyama was visiting relatives to the south of Tokyo when she heard the dreaded news. She immediately rushed back to the capital to be with her husband. She fully anticipated that the general would kill himself, and she wanted to be with him in his last hour. When she reached the city, Sugiyama greeted her warmly and told her that he had been admonished by the emperor to do everything he could to speed demobilization of the troops around the city. After General Anami's death, the emperor had asked the senior officers to forget their personal feelings and devote themselves to the nation in the difficult days ahead. His wife was shocked. For two days she brooded. A normally pleasant, even dispositioned lady, she usually radiated a genuine warmth to those around her. Plump and small, she reminded everyone of a smiling Buddha. But the woman who greeted her husband when he came home on the night of the 17th of August was far from even-tempered. She was almost hysterical as she berated him. When are you going to commit suicide? She asked in a shrill voice. The general looked closely at her. Her eyes were wide with excitement, her features flushed with anger. He was dumbfounded. I have a responsibility to the emperor right now. It's important that I stay alive to serve him. It is more important that you atone for the surrender, she cried. The couple argued heatedly over the question of his death and later went to bed in a strained atmosphere. Each night thereafter, the argument continued. After the servants had gone to bed, the woman pressed her husband for an answer, and he put off the question. Neighbours noticed that Mrs. Sugiyama was becoming more distraught, more wild-eyed. She no longer smiled. She pouted in frustration. On the seventh day, she confronted the general once more in his bedroom. When are you going to commit, Harakiri? she repeated. The general braced for another tirade as she continued. I will die before you if you don't go through with it. Sugiyama was shattered. His wife was goading him, taunting him with the prospect of her own suicide. It was the last blow. He gazed steadily at her, then spoke softly. All right, I'll do it, but you must promise not to think of doing the same thing. Mrs. Sugiyama smiled at him for the first time in days, and then bowed deeply. They went to sleep beside each other. On the next day, Sugiyama was a witness to the death of General Seichi Tanaka, and his resolve to die was strengthened by his friend's suicide. With his mind firmly made up, 
he approached his last military task with great fervour. The first army around Tokyo was completely equipped with weapons, and it was imperative to withdraw the units from the area to be occupied by the Americans in a few short days. Sugiyama plunged gratefully into the assignment. A thought kept nagging at him. A few days before, he had seen his wife sewing material for two white ceremonial kimonos, normally used only in suicide rituals. Though he remembered her recent threat, he hesitated to believe that she would follow through with it. Still, it bothered him. The general tried to put it out of his mind, but the memory of the two kimonos returned constantly. On the 5th of September, General Sugiyama went to a most important appointment. After the Americans landed at Atsugi and Yokosuka, he was summoned to the headquarters of Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, commander of the 8th United States Army. There he would formally surrender his army. His first reaction was to refuse, not because he balked at turning over his command, but rather because Eichelberger was beneath him in rank. Sugiyama considered it an insult to have to treat with a junior officer. Only the calm persuasion of his secretary, Kobayashi, prevented a major incident. The colonel told him repeatedly that it was not intended as a slur against him, that Eichelberger was in fact the legitimate representative of the American forces in the Tokyo area. Even on the way to Yokohama, Sugiyama grumbled about the alleged slight, but he went into the conference room and bowed to the inevitable. Eichelberger was a courtly man, a gentleman in a cruel business. Realising the turmoil that Sugiyama must be suffering, he treated him with courtesy and dignity. The Japanese was charmed and grateful. Eichelberger's generous conduct earned him Sugiyama's almost slavish loyalty in the days ahead. As the two ended their discussions of the steps to be taken in withdrawing Japanese forces away from Tokyo, Eichelberger observed, I'm sorry we have to meet under such circumstances. Sugiyama nodded gratefully and withdrew. The next six days were pleasant ones for him. Kept busy by the delicate task of moving his men out of the path of advancing occupation troops, he worked diligently to cooperate with the Americans. His home life had returned to normal. His wife was again pleasant and thoughtful. Their last days together were serene. They spoke no more of suicide. By the 11th of September, the last of the Japanese forces had gone north of the Tone River. No incidents had been reported between the opposing armies. Sugiyama had helped finish a most difficult task, and now his work was ended. That evening he invited Kobayashi to dinner. The news of Tojo's attempted suicide had filtered in, and the three deplored the bungled attempt. They also talked about the list of war criminals issued that day by MacArthur's headquarters. Sugiyama wondered if he was included. His career had mirrored the rise of the Imperial Japanese Army to dominance in Japanese governmental affairs. As a leader of the conservative section of the general staff, he embraced and sometimes advocated policies which had led the nation down the road to war. Sugiyama had been a strong proponent of the pacification of China. It was rumoured that the emperor had lost faith in him in that period, because the general assured him that the China situation would be resolved quickly. Though the field marshal was far from being a fanatical exponent of expanding Japanese hegemony over vast areas of the Pacific, he knew that he might be indicted by the Allies, if only for one incident in his career. In April 1942, he and others in the military had been shocked at the daring raid on Tokyo by the Doolittle Flyers. When eight of them were captured after crash landing in China, Sugiyama had concurred in a decision that resulted in the execution of three of the imprisoned men. He had even gone to Tojo and demanded that punitive measures be taken against them. Now, three years later, the Americans would probably remember the part he played in that affair. But Sugiyama had no intention of waiting for a summons. On the next morning, September 12, 1945, General Sugiyama appeared at his office on Ichigaya Heights. At 10 a.m. he called Kobayashi to him. I want you to do me one last favor. Please go to my wife and find out what she plans to do. I have been so worried that she might kill herself, and I want to make sure that she has no such intention. Kobayashi promised to go right away, and shortly thereafter drove to the Sugiyama home. There he confided the general's fears to his wife. She laughed gaily and said, Don't worry, I can't commit suicide because I'm an old woman and much too weak to do such a thing. I know General Sugiyama will do it, and that is enough.
The colonel rushed back to Ichigaya and repeated these words to the general, who sat back in his chair and sighed contentedly. She had been his only concern, and now his mind was at rest. Thank you, Kobayashi. Everything is all right now. The colonel went to his office and sat thinking of the two people he loved so deeply. Fifteen minutes later, he heard a gunshot and rushed out into the corridor. The door to Sugiyama's office was open, and Kobayashi ran to it. After taking off his officer's tunic, the general had seated himself in a comfortable chair. Then he had pressed a service revolver to his white shirt and fired into his chest. Unlike Hideki Tojo, Sugiyama had found the mark and fallen unconscious. Kobayashi was overcome by grief as he stood beside the dying man. Noting that the general was perspiring greatly, he brought out a handkerchief and tenderly wiped his brow. The secretary whispered, This is Kobayashi. This is Kobayashi. Sugiyama's head rolled upward slightly and nodded several times as he tried to recognize the presence of his aide. Then he slumped further into a coma. Other officers came to the room and watched the field marshal as he labored for final breaths. One of them told Kobayashi that he had just called Mrs. Sugiyama to give her the sad news. She had asked only one question. Is he really dead? When the officer said that he was, Mrs. Sugiyama had hung up. As this information was given to the saddened Kobayashi, he was suddenly alarmed and sensed that he should go immediately to the Sugiyama home. He drove quickly to the suburbs and hastened into the house. The general's adopted daughter stood in the reception hall, her face lined with horror. Kobayashi brushed by her and went to the bedroom. As he opened the door, he realized that he was too late. Mrs. Sugiyama had put down the telephone and gone to her room. There she knelt before a Buddhist temple and prayed. Taking a small ceremonial knife in her hand, she pressed it to the front of her kimono. Then she picked up a cup and drained its contents. She fell forward onto the tiny knife, which pricked her chest and drew a small amount of blood. The dagger did not inflict the mortal wound. The cyanide in the cup did. Kobayashi called and called her name, but she could not answer. As he looked on helplessly, she died on the floor.